Hello, hello, family. Hello, how are you? Welcome, welcome, welcome back. Yo, it's, it's been a busy day for this little lady, but I'm so glad that you guys join and watch these videos um, when you get a moment. Like, fam, this is this is awesome. Oh yeah, also today I am rocking my Black to, Black in the Future from Harrisburg YPOC's Black in the Berg event this year. I just I just love it. It's just really nice. I'm, like you see, like it's beautiful graphics, all that good stuff, and it actually goes quite well with our topic today. We will be discussing implicit bias, right, in context of abuse, really, and how that feeds into various ways that people can experience um, abuse in the form of harassment or assault. And as usual, y'all know, you know, we got we got the one and only, huh? Dr. Anju Singh, she's in the house with us. She is coming through and I'd like to invite her. Uh, so please take a moment, first of all, share, 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 let your friends know, tell them to come on through. And if you're watching this later, still share, share with your friends because it might help the next person. It just might, because these are things that we need to be talking about we need to normalize. We need to make sure that folks get comfortable having these uncomfortable conversations. And that's why I tell y'all, pull up and let's talk about it. So let's get right into it. Welcome, Dr. Singh. Hi, y'all. <laughs> oh, hey, we love your hairstyle, though. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yo, today it was hair day. It was hair half day. And oh, yeah, I, I will keep plugging her. So I got what's called Momo's natural hair really really rocks her products bam i got the coiliest of coily curls but this this is for the gods and goddesses out here because it, like, it smells great like from the co-wash and it actually like lathers up because i don't do shampoo and it is like i was like i need to call her and order some more like i need to tell my people i'm like yo see like, i don't this. like putting products in my hair i don't like the stiffy stuff so i always have this food <laughs> when it gets humid <laughs> but, like bam her stuff yo her stuff is so good like and it smells so good too because i don't like i don't like stuff with a lot of chemically smell like it's i, I prefer like very not like all, yeah because all her stuff is natural products because that's I stick to and it's just I like stuff that smells just like food and fruits and stuff like that but anywho that was that and I'm like I was like okay this is this is what we got so thank you thank you so much I appreciate you so we're gonna get right into it um please take a moment to introduce yourself to the people in case they have not caught up on all the other topics you've discussed so far <laughs> let them know who you are and how they can connect with you hopefully you know do, after this session and we'll get right into it about implicit bias. Thank you. Cool. So I'm Dr. Anju Singh. Uh, I'm a mom. I identify as a female. I'm an immigrant. I'm a person of color. I am a business owner. I am also a professor. And I'm also running for Prothonotary in Dauphin County. <laughs> <laughs> you see how busy she, yo, to me, all I heard was, oh, girl, just, where does the time go? Like know, we're right? constantly running, like doing things. Like and also you gotta move and shake. You gotta move and shake. It's the only we, way to make the change. You got to. We got we got to. Especially just in light of this season. Not I'm not just talking about, oh, it's summer. It's it's the it's the season of life and life awakening and life awareness. <laughs> that we are that we've been stepping into that's been a long time coming overdue i am just so happy that we're finally in a place where we're getting comfortable or rather getting comfortable being uncomfortable having these uncomfortable conversations <laughs> that should be on a t-shirt maybe i'll get that <laughs> Yeah, you know, and, I, and I'm so happy. We're, we're, we're starting the pond yeah you know because it, it's it's been it's been it's been happening. Like th these are not new things. It's just the only thing new about it is that we're finally giving it a voice. We're finally identifying it and we're giving it a name. About it and nobody can shut us up. Oh, oh that was the oh, problem. Oh, Again, you know, I I loved President uh, Barack Obama, but during mm -hmm. his presidency, you speak the word racism, people <gasps> shut you out. You couldn't speak the word racism because right. people would say, have you seen who's the president? What it are you talking about? no longer about? exists. Exactly, exactly. Like, a black president does not erase, does not, does, does not negate the existence 
of very deeply rooted I, faulty ideologies right. and, and indoctrinations. I was like, and you don't just wake up one day. Them, I think really brewed under the surface. <laughs> Thank you. Because they couldn't tolerate Barack Obama as the president. They just couldn't tolerate having President Obama in the White House. So, it, so I think racism actually increased during that time okay. and we couldn't talk about it. That part, yo, like, it, like and if anything, the, oh, I, Yo, that's a, that was a great place to really you you forever just be jumping right right into it, and I love it. Um, <laughs> yes, because right, it's like a, it was like this this oxymoron or contradictory like ideology and experience where on the one hand people were like oh like you know we we making we making change we're moving forward we're moving past this thing that people still didn't even want to acknowledge what the thing was to begin with, right? So it was like oh we're past it. We move, I was like. We passed what? Like what part of it exactly have we moved past? Can, can we like because you can't you can't even say the name, you can't even say the word. So how have we moved past it? it we haven't like, moved past anything. I mean, look right? at the condition. Again, I was not very well versed and educated on politics. I had very little uh, knowledge about it, just based on what you read mm -hmm. in the media and the news. Yeah. But the only reason I think uh, uh, President Barack Obama, quote unquote, was allowed to become president was the crap left behind by Bush. Nobody else okay. wanted to clean up that cl crap. Can you talk about that? Can we, can we get real about that? that crap. And that's how uh, President Barack Obama even had the opportunity to become. So we weren't getting past anything. We hadn't evolved. No. We hadn't achieved equality. They needed someone to cre clean up the crap. That come out, and he was he, yeah. he has been the best president of our lifetime, the best so, president. And as much as I really dislike saying it, I think right. the only quote unquote positive out of President Trump is okay. We've become loud. Yeah, we're having protests. We're out in the streets, and nobody yes. can say we are wrong. I am More glad you said it. Anymore, that this is wrong, that we don't have racism, we don't have sexism, we don't have misogyny, we don't have, you know, we don't have hatred in our country. Nobody can say that right. anymore because President <laughs> Trump brought it to the surface. That part, like, and, that, and like for me, like, I love when we, when we, when we address it head on because oftentimes it's, we skirt around it. We're like, oh, it wasn't so bad. I'm like, oh, it was so good back then. And then we had a moment of snafu, and but like we, but we're back all right now. But I'm like, no, like let's really address each of those seasons, right? Where you know you have this, the first, your first black officially elected president, right? And it, I also, I also recognize that he is a bi ethnic. He's multi ethnic person. But you know, it's it's the it's the recognition of he. It was no longer the status quo of another white man, you know. And like, and we understand, we understand, and we acknowledge the significance of that. But even in that, or rather, and even in that, it was this this idea that racism was all over. But really, what happened is it went under. It became something more subtle. Where people are like, well, people got to feel good yeah, about, uh, but I voted for the president. I may still be a racist, but I voted for the for the black president. I voted for the black man, the first time, the first time only. Because we know there are people who like, I already did my part. I already, I already did that once. I don't need to do it again. Because you know, I am no longer racist. I can go back to being, you know, what I used to be. Whatever right. that was, right. and then and then you know after that, then it's interesting how like it's almost like we we got the stark opposite. It's like it was like this a rubber band that was being pulled, 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 and then it was snapped and let go. And overnight, overnight, people's implicit and explicit biases like rushed to the forefront. Like it was just waiting to get out. It was just waiting. And, 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 but I'm like, to me, I was like, I was not shocked. People are like, oh, I am shocked. This is not who oh, we I are. Was I was disappointed. I was disappointed. I was in disbelief. I mean, against Hillary Clinton. I'll be oh, honest okay. with you. In, in, in when Barack yeah. Obama and Hillary Clinton were running against each other within the Democratic Party, mm -hmm. um, at that time, 
Well, my personal thing is because of how Hillary handled the whole Monica Lewinsky thing, she kind of sort of lost my respect at that point. Listen. I had a lot of listen. I'm, yeah. It, it was between like, that. It, it was the Libya thing, and she just had she had a few things that I was yeah. just like. This. So between Barack and and Hillary, I would have put picked Barack Obama, but between Barack and Trump, I thought it was a oh, choice. Clear. I would I would hope it was a very clear decision, but apparently it was not. It was and not. That, a, that's what brings us to this implicit bias topic today. That part. That right. right? Yeah. Oh, Right, and, and, and I mean, like, but also, sorry. Let's take a quick, uh, you know, maybe one or two more minutes to directly address. Also, right, when we're in context of implicit bias, right? Forty fives, forty fives, whole campaign was really a lot of those implicit bias conversations and comments. It, it in was people. littered. Yeah. It was littered in there. It was like even the way he spoke about women. Right, like how do you how how do you deal with them? You know, oh, I would something. I don't know. I don't. I don't quote me, but like something along the oh, back in back in my day or back in those days. That comment about oh, back in my day, we'll take him out. You know, in the back or, or the, I wish it was back then. And I was like, well, what do you? What exactly do you mean? Like, back oh, then I think there were his, his, his most um, outrageous comment was, oh, I can grab them. Right, and that one, or or also the one where. I could kill somebody on Saks Fifth and still get away. Like he was so bold about that stuff. And it was, I was like, are, are we hearing the same thing? Cause for me, I was like, typically if it was any other person, if it was any, especially God forbid, it's a person of color or a black person, a black man, like. And what he was, was doing, what he was doing by saying those things, he was strengthening confirmation bias. That, that, okay, come on. There are 32 different kinds of biases. And he was feeding people's biases. He was, he was fueling the biases. Like, seriously, I was just like, there is no way we're watching the same campaign. And then, and then for it to still come out as it was on that first round, I was just like, oh, are y'all really showing out? Like, you know, and, and and for me, like it was. I remember, I remember them announcing his win, like it was yesterday. Like I, I remember sitting down on my kitchen table, having my cup of coffee, and then seeing he's the president. I'm like, yeah. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. Right. And and for me, it was I like, mean, and for me, joke. This is a joke. This can't be. <laughs> I, I. That's what I thought. Of. I was like, let me check to see if it's the onion or something, but it was not. It was a reputable source, and I was like, "No, no way!" And 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 then and knowing that it wasn't just me feeling it; it was many other people, right? Other people of various intersectional identities, really just having this moment of like realization that, oh, like our life is really going to be very. I, to, to say difficult is like an understatement because the very next day, a close person to me calls me and the, and the person is like, oh, I was pumping my gas today and like some random stranger walks up to her and is like, oh, you know, because she was talking on the phone to me, not in English. And somebody tell, you know, yells at her, oh, you should go back to your country. It's It's Trump's country now. Literally, the very next day after it was announced. I mean, like, I, you know, I accepted what, it for what it was, but like for it to happen that quickly, like the very next day we saw incidents happening where people felt so like emboldened to be like, oh, we got the green light to go. And to me, I was thinking, well, if he didn't win, so then what would have happened? Would you have reverted to being a closet yeah. racist? Yeah. Oh, would you like, there was you know, a question actually, uh, I think there was a question I sent out by the Women's March asking that had Hillary Clinton won the election, would hmm. we have had all these conversations? Would we have had the Women's March? Would we have had the Me Too movement? Would we have had, where would Black Lives Matter be at this point? And the unfortunate truth is we probably would not have had all this. We would have, we would said, have been oh, thrown back in the closet. 
we would have had that same thing that we had when Barack Obama became the president. Oh, now we've got the woman who's a president, so we've achieved sexual equality, gender yes. equality. Yeah. And, and, and we would but, be complicit. And the yeah, sex yeah. people would be seething under the surface. That part. That part. And, and for me, it was, I also noticed that under President Obama, in as much as you know, he was he was that representation of oh we we're, we're, we're pushing the needle forward. It was still very clear that and 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 he he does write this in his book. He he addresses it in his book as well about how he couldn't quite adamantly call out certain issues, whether it was racism, right, or issues that directly affected black and brown people. Like he couldn't directly call it out because of his position, because it would look some type of way. Whereas as we see, like President Biden, he can call it out. He can be like, da, 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 even in his campaign, I was like, I remember having this conversation of like, Biden can say it, but Obama could not. And then I was thinking, well, if on the flip side, if it was Hillary, would she have had to tote that same line of respectability politics of, you know, oh, if she says something about women, then it's just her, you know, oh, she only cares about women. Because who Hillary is, she probably would not. Like that part, come on, sis, okay? Because, right, because it goes back to that complex intersectionality of like, depending on where you are on that spectrum, you do get certain privileges and you on the flip side, you do sometimes have to toe the line a bit more strictly. Yeah, so that was just me. That's, that's the tough part. I think for any politician, that's the tough part. The tricky part becomes is if you really vehemently stand for what you stand for, mm -hmm. you run the risk of losing some supporters because not everyone's going to agree with you. And politicians seem, seem to be more often preoccupied mm -hmm. with winning both and winning favors than actually taking a stance and doing what they believe is really right. Mm. You know? And we need to change that culture. Yeah. Is put the people first. You politicians are appointed, elected by the people for the people. So people yeah. should always be first. People should always be first. And yes, they will 100% of the population never agrees on one thing. There will always be differences. But then that's why we have, you know, Democratic Party, Republican Party, Independent Party, whether you're right or left or whatever, you stand okay. for those ethics. But once yeah. you're in an elected office, once yeah. you're in an elected office, then you represent all the people irrespective of their party affiliation. Yes. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so politicians tend to play this dance where they don't clearly come out and take a stance and... They're constantly trying to win favors. They have to constantly spend time on fundraising. And I'm like, no, you're supposed to be working for the people. Where's the work for the people? That's the part that gets to me. And, and that's the thing where I, and I, and I have, I, I, I hesitate to call it out, but it's like, I recently, I, I recently saw the the flip side of that the the positive aspect of really being for the people where recently one of my one of my girlfriends um she was running for to candid candidacy in a different location right and i was just like so amazed at so like she was running as a democrat right and and i mean like like you said she she literally had like a skeletal like budget, you know, but because and her her focus was listen. I'll just go out and talk to the people. But also, she had been doing the work, and I keep telling people, if you have been doing the work, if you have been in the community, if you have been serving, on whatever capacity that you are capable of doing, and that's like you thought there's value in doing the work. If people know you from being in the community, being about the community, serving. They will support you regardless of party affiliation. You ain't, you don't have, you, like, I, okay, okay, let me correct, okay. I will, I, will, I, will, I, will, and I will clarify it with this, right? So with her, although she ran as a Democrat, she actually also got written in by the Republicans and she didn't have to play that game 
you know, because she, she was not she was not on the Republican ticket, so that's why they had to write they had to write her in. And I was like, what? I was like, I mean, I was in shock because I'm like, sis, like you've been doing the work. Like people know you. Like her her whole her whole campaign was just I'm gonna go talk to people. I'm gonna go knock on doors and genuinely like figure out what they want and what they're because I'm like, but she she that's what she had been doing with all the all the like other work, the volunteer and like the community service that she had been doing, like. They were. They already knew her. They already were familiar with what her what her platform was, is, and will be. And and even after that, they were like, "Hey, we want to formally add you to the docket." So she didn't go asking to be added. Then uh, like they're like, "Can we add you to the Republican ticket?" And I was like, "Like to me, I'm like that's that's what it's about." Because like and because she said just what you said. That's she the kind said, of Exactly, because like, and you you said it perfectly right. You're like, if you get if if and when you get elected, it's not about just serving the people who affiliate with whatever party that you know that that served you or that funded you. It's about really seeing that this is what the people said they want, and if this is what they want, serve all of them, represent all of them. But sadly enough, that's typically not what happens. But such is right. And and again, so that, that okay, tying that back to the bias thing is we see that expressed in how politicians, even even how they talk, right? It, 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 and that's the implicit part, part of it, right? And how people, you know, have these you know implications when they say, when they say, when they throw out certain phrases, right? When you prejudge a grouping of people, let's say, you know, well, as as we as we mentioned with 45, how he would talk about immigrants. Or how, like I said, how he would talk about women, you know, how you talk about women who didn't fit a certain standard of beauty. Not my type. Right? Right. Saying, oh, that person could never be abused because, oh, I would I would never want to abuse them. But I'm like, but that's not how abuse works. It's all about power play. Like, I guess you skipped that part in consent education. Even saying that is abusive. That, just saying that is verbal abuse. Yeah. Because what he's also saying is the other type he would have used. Okay. okay. <laughs> Yo. She Thank you for calling. Type, yeah. I wouldn't abuse her. Oh, but so the way, type you would right. abuse? Okay, right? And so that also, and, and I was, yeah, I was going to, because I was thinking that. I was like, so you're saying, it, hold on. And then I was like, but, you, but also you have an unfair power position with those type of women and you tend to surround yourself with them. So does that say that that is something that you likely would have done? There's a name for that. When you surround yourself with certain kind of people and you make them your kind of, so there are mm. 32 different kinds of biases. Mm. bias. It's called mm. affinity bias. Wow. Affinity bias? Affinity bias, yeah. So let's go into bias. What yes. number one? What is implicit bias? And I'm mm -hmm. going to and I'm going to give references. So I want to make sure I give credit where credit is due. I'm right. going to read a short paragraph from a textbook of biology. It's literally basic introduct introduction of biology, and this chapter is on biology of wrongful conviction. Oh, chapter on biology of wrongful conviction. So we talk about genetics and everything. And then we end this on this chapter, and I'll just read a short thing on implicit bias. Basically, what happens is there is no real reliable correlation between appearance and behavior. Scientifically, there is no correlation between appearance and behavior. However, um, also, uh, it, it's not likely that criminals are born that way. Nobody's born a criminal. Okay, some people may argue about the genetic predispositions and high risk factors and environmental factors, but nobody's born that way. Okay, it is also important to recognize that our brains continually fool us on some of these points. That is, we all have developed some subconscious frameworks that affect our feelings about other people based on what we physically observe. Get it? So mm, this, this framework develops over our lifetime through exposure uh, to direct or indirect associations. Mm. Okay? 
And this is a convenient shortcut our brain usually performs. So sometimes when you're put in situations, we have to make decisions really quickly on a short period of time. We have to quickly process a lot of information and how our brain gets trained to process that information and make a quick judgment in a short period of time. That is implicit bias. Does that make sense? Okay, this yeah. kind of shortcut makes uh, uh, this kind of shortcut. Uh, ancestors often had to make quick decisions about, say, for instance, the safety of a location based on subtle physical cues. So you go in, you see a cave, you see dark things, you see rocks, you see this, you see that, and your yeah. experience has told you, wait a second, those kind of crevices, snakes and scorpions are going to be there. That yeah. kind of places, bats are going to be there. This yeah. kind of place, the rocks are going to fall. So your lifetime experiences have taught you what could be safe, what could be not safe. Context clues. And you quickly scan the area and make a decision, okay, this is not a safe place, or this looks like a safe place. Correct. So you process all of that information in short period of time, especially when it's a, it's, you know, your li a, a life and death matter. You don't have time to think and process. You have to make decisions quickly. That's when implicit bias really kicks in. Get it? Yeah. So you learned the clues to look for uh, from their experiences and or from shared experiences. Mm -hmm. This subconscious framework is what's known as implicit bias. Now apply that to racism. If you've grown up in a homogenous society and have not been exposed to anyone from the outside, mm -hmm. and you with things like, you know, uh, stranger danger, don't yeah. talk to strangers, those people, we don't know who they are, how they are, yada, yada, yada. You grow up like that, you've not been exposed to others, mm -hmm. or you're fed media. Okay. Thank you. I was going to say. Media constantly stereotyping and constantly making criminals look a certain way. Yeah. So the bad guys usually look like they're unkempt. Yeah. Or they're really profiled. The way they physically look, they look like homeless hobos. That's Criminal appearance, right? Can we and talk about criminality guys, too while we're at it? Yeah, but you're right. Say that you're right. I was like, can we all, I was like, criminology 101, right? How how the system defines what, what a criminal is. Like, like it's a it's weird. And then and, and I've heard it often also, you know, clarify that criminology, sadly, is high, just highly connected to just simple characteristics of blackness. Or, or of black lived experiences. And that's that's implicit bias. That yeah. is implicit bias. If a person is well kept, well groomed, well dressed, we presume they are yes. good people. Ooh, ooh, and then, oh, and I love the also like going back to the stranger danger um idea uh that you that you that you explained, right? It's funny how oh, no, it's not funny, it's sad really, how and scary in the way that you know when when we even when we teach young ones about um, safety and bodily autonomy and consent and like the potential for abuse. We're like, oh, it, it's a stranger. If a stranger touches you, if a stranger like makes you uncomfortable, then tell us. But even as we've seen the research and statistics actually show that oftentimes it is somebody who they're actually familiar with. It's somebody who comes off nice. You know, it's like, oh, it's your aunt, it's your babysitter, it's your father, it's your mother, it's your sister. It's like, we oftentimes don't remind them that, oh, the stranger could be the person living within the house with you or somebody who is assumed to be okay. I was going to say that's almost like the flip side of implicit bias. Mm -hmm. So your implicit bias, if you were raised to say stranger danger, mm -hmm. your implicit bias allows you to let your guard down in front of someone <gasps> not a stranger. Yes. 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 The opposite side of that coin yes. of implicit bias. Yeah. So your guard is up when you're in front of a stranger. You're more mindful and cautious when mm -hmm. you're with someone, uh, uh, but you let your guard down. You yeah. are more comfortable with the, the way you speak, the way you dress, what you yes. eat, think. Yes. <gasps> yes. Yeah. So you make yeah. yourself more vulnerable, and that's what the non-stranger takes advantage of. So that's the flip side, or rather the disadvantage of implicit bias. Does that make sense? I love, I love the, I mean, I love this conversation. Like, <laughs> I listen, I love this. I just love, I love the way, and I truly appreciate the way 
you bring you bring it bring it in such a practical way because for me that's my biggest thing i love when we make technical conversation and technical jargon really just practical and make it make sense for like because people you know oftentimes even when we talk about research when we talk about you know the the statistical side of things or the medical or the scientific side of it a lot of that actually gets lost in translation and people then are like oh that has nothing to do with me i don't know what you're talking about which is again one of the reasons i really do appreciate you doing this because it is so important to do the work right because th these are issues that the community faces and again and we've seen it even here locally there are certain issues that I'm like, these are very systemic issues that we need to address from the root causes, not just the, you know, the symptoms that come out of it, right? Into whether it's, whether it's child abuse, um, you know, intimate partner abuse, because that happens too, especially during Rona, we've seen that the numbers, um, it's, I don't, and I'm not sure if it's that there, it's happening more or that it's just being reported more. Reported more. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. And, and and again, going back to implicit bias as you as you are as you are defining for us, um, man, even in how it shows up in in prof in the professional sector, right? Whether it's in hiring practices, educational industries, in, you know, school to prison pipelines, the medical industry. They all go ahead. You're about to read. I'm gonna shut up. <laughs> Okay. So um, I did so uh, on LinkedIn. Just resources for people who are interested to learn more. I'm I'm a big supporter of trying to always learn, soak up. As I said last time, I never call myself an expert on everything. I'm a lifetime student. There is so much to learn. Yes. Like the I'm the full 180 degrees of Trump. Trump always says I'm a genius. I'm this. I'm right. I'm, I'm right. Like, if you are really truly honest to yourself. The more you read, the more you learn. What you really learn is how little you know. Oh, that part. I was just I was just saying that today. I was like, I really, in as much as I have been intentional in growing and learning in, in various areas of new um skills and, and 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 passion, I'm like, oh my God, like there's so much more. It's like the more I learn, the more that, I learn that I need to learn. And that's a Dunning Kruger effect. Do you know the Dunning Kruger oh, effect? Share with us. Clack, clack, for us what that is. It, it's a very really nice cartoon, the Dunning Kruger effect. So the people who don't know anything, they think they know everything. <gasps> I'm, okay, yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Oh. And people who know a lot, what they really yes. know is how little they really know. Yes. Yeah, it's like knowing. Yo, I had a professional setting experience of such of such happenings where. The, the other person was like, oh, I'm an expert. I'm a freaking expert in this. And I was like, all right, go ahead. And I was like, are we, are we? I was like, excuse me, but I have been, I cannot, I cannot provide further input on that because I recognize the limitations of my expertise, please and thank you. Right. And I had to excuse myself because I was like, I'm not, I'm not, I cannot hitch my, my horse to that wagon right. or my wagon to that horse. Cause I was just like, right. So in my process of learning, mm. my source today is going to be uh, Dr. Tana Sessions. And she's an author of a book called Working While Black, mm. a Woman's Guide to Stop Being the Best Kept Secret. Mm. So that's a good book. I have not read it, but I intend to read it. That's on my list. But she talks about all the different kinds of bias. So here's a news flash. All of us have biases. We all have biases. If you and I were two, moms, if you and I were two moms sitting on the bench of the baseball field, we'd be comparing notes about our children. And of course, my children are going to be better than your children. <laughs> that's that, that's, that's every immigrant bias. mother too. Every immigrant mother and auntie. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's our bias. Yes. We're going to portray our kids better. We're going to favor our own kids. We'll be nice to the other kids, but we're going to yeah. always favor our own kids. Okay. Right? That's our bias. Okay. So all of us have bias. Yeah. The trick is can we recognize it? Mm. Can we manage it? Mm. Yes. Yo. And thank you for reminding us that because I've been in situations where I was having these kind of conversations. And folks are quick to say, well, I have, I don't have any implicit bias. That's not, I was, I was like, I was like, do you understand what the definition is at base of what implicit bias is? Like, it's not necessarily a bad thing. 
you know. It's the thing, I don't have an accent. If you're speaking, you have an accent. <gasps> yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Because even mine, I realize like mine sometimes changes in context of like how, like in what language I'm thinking in my head. Yeah. So when they, when people use the word accent, mm -hmm. when they say you don't have an accent, what they're really saying is your accent is like the same accent that we use. Yes. Yes, exactly. We all have an accent. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right? Le yeah. So you have an American accent. You have a North American accent, South American accent, <laughs> British accent, Australian accent. Or do you speak like an Indian? <laughs> uh, right. right. But, but, even, but even Indians, like, right, even, like, in, like, in areas that have, like, different dialects in it, even they, too, have, like, different accents. Because I know in Kenya, like, we have 42 different, at least 42 different tribes. And I remember, like, people had different accents, even just in our schools, our classes. In language, I think they, uh, um, some language literature said every hundred miles, mm. accent changes. Birds have accents. What? Birds have accents. So the oh. robin in, uh, in Pennsylvania has a different accent from the robin in California. <laughs> oh my gosh! I didn't, that cool? I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. You're going to learn something new today, family. <laughs> Look at us learning. All right. So this is what Tana, uh, Dr. Tana Sessions has to say. Number one, as I said, everyone has biases. We all have biases. The question is, number one, are we aware of them? Do we know how to recognize them? Do we know how to manage them? And the bias becomes a problem if you're in a position of power over somebody else. That's when the bias becomes a problem. If I have a bias, but I don't have a job and I have no influence over anybody. My biases don't mean a thing to anybody. But if you're someone in a position of power, if you're in a position to hire people, fire people, if you're in a position to arrest people, kill people, oh. now your bias is important. And therefore, it becomes even more important for you to get trained how to recognize that bias, how to manage the bias. Mm -hmm. And if, if possible, eliminate the bias. But elimination will come with regular management and uh, recognition. That's Correct. How Make sure your actions don't play out your bias. Mm. Right? Self-awareness is key. Oh, that part. Say that again for the people. I'll shut up. Self-awareness is key. As I had said one in one of our previous talks, is you got to go splunking into the caverns of your soul because all of our biases are hiding in those dark, dark crevices that we hide under, we rationalize it, we justify it. Right. So that's where our biases are hiding in those dark corners. And we cover them up with rationalization and justification. So what mm. are some of the biases? So, we, you know, we've all heard a lot about implicit bias. Yeah. But it's like it's like it's like an onion with many layers. Mm. There are many different kind of biases and all support each other. It's like a domino effect. Yeah. And they all support each other and build up. And then you cross that threshold and make a decision that can have a huge impact on the other person. Right. Mm. It's like, you know, intersectionality. Yes. You're a female. You're a yes. person of color and you're from the LGBT community community. OK. And your risk of being vulnerable to being abused, to being categorized right. is now three times higher than someone who's just a woman, but mm -hmm. not a person of color, not from the LGBT community, a white woman. All right. Or add immigrant to that or add non-cis. I was like. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Non-English speaking. Okay. Or if you're overweight or if like you're, you're larger or a small petite person. I was like, no. You keep adding factors and you yeah. keep including. So they add up. They have that synergistic or additive effect, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what happens in biases. We all have implicit bias, but right. add to that confirmation bias, add to that the affinity bias, add to that the halo effect, add to that the horn mm -hmm. effect. Add all these effects to that. And now you're making decisions that you would not make if you were aware of these biases. Yeah. Especially mm. if you're in a position of hiring, firing, or shooting people. Or killing somebody. Yeah. Right? So what is confirmation bias? Confirmation bias is basically when you have some sort of a belief or an assumption. And this is true even in science. Even scientists have to be very careful about their confirmation bias. Because if you come up with a hypothesis. Yes. Once you have a hypothesis, mm -hmm. then every piece of data you look for, you will find data to support your hypothesis. That is, yes, right? Because, yeah, that, I mean, that is, that is that's the, nature. That's, the that's, that's the nature of data. And, and, and I, so I actually like, so one of the books I really liked on that was called 
Dan Wise and Statistics, I think that's what the name is. And it was, to me, like, that was, like, the first time I, like, it was in my early years of college. And I was, like, that was the first time it really hit me, the way statistics can be manipulated to. Abraham Lincoln said numbers are liars. Right, exactly. Because people always like, well, data doesn't lie. Data doesn't lie. I'm like, but it, okay, it may not lie, but it does not tell you the full truth either. You That's can you need context. To tell you what you wanted to tell you. And you may not be doing it consciously. That's the whole trick of <sighs> bias. It's unconscious. It creeps in. Mm, come on. You have to be extra mindful. You have to be really, really extra mindful. You have to be very transparent. And, and, mm. and Adams, I think Grant Adams wrote an article about brutally honest. So he wants mm. us to go away from the word. I used to, I use the word brutally honest very often. So I was mm. going to say you have to be brutally honest with yourself. Mm. But I think the word he wants us to use uh, or recommends that we should be using because you don't want to be brutal with yourself. Br brutal with yourself. <laughs> I don't want to. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, so I think what he was saying uh, is you want to be um, radically honest. Oh, I like that. I like that. And that's the that's the choice of word is you want to be radically honest with yourself. Mm. I would mm. say the bias is when you have a belief system or an assumption about a person. And when you have that, then you have a tendency to ignore or to forget anything else that contradicts your belief. That's your confirmation bias. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So the way you do is you, uh, how do you identify it or manage it? You first of all, conduct a self check again, self-awareness, constantly ask yourself, is this following because of my own belief system and assumption or am I being objective? Mm, okay. Yes. Then uh, say, suppose you're in an interview process or something. And I think this particular uh, session that I read on LinkedIn, they, you know, LinkedIn is offering a lot of these lessons. Which I love, by the way. Yeah, so I, I try and do a lot of those if I can. And this was specifically for rec recruiters, was if you're recruiting, make sure you're asking the same questions to all the candidates. Don't allow your questions to go in different directions for different candidates because then you're not evaluating them all on the same uh, benchmark. Correct, yeah. Same benchmark. So ask the same questions and include other people to so have a panel. Yes. So, yes. you, so your biases can be then uh, hopefully neutralized or picked up by someone else. Correct. And peer-reviewed articles in science are so important. Yes, I was going to say, that's I, I, you, you said it, yeah, peer reviews, so important, so important. And that's why, that's why in science, when you write your articles, you write your hypothesis in a separate section, you write your methods in a separate section, you write your results or your data in a separate section, and then you write your interpretation and conclusion separately. Why? Because if somebody else wants to take another look at it, you want them to just take the data piece out and look at it without looking at your conclusion, without looking at your background and significance and rationalization. Because in your background significance methodology, you built your rationale for how you designed your experiments and your study. And in the conclusion, you're showing how you analyze your data. Allow someone to look at just your data mm. without it being tainted by your rationale and your thinking and your logic and or your interpretation and analysis. Because two people can look at the exact same data and come up with 180 degrees different opinions. And okay, people. yes. That's, I, again, that's why I'm a, I'm a big fan, or rather I'm a big proponent for also being intentional even in the collection phase of really getting contextual data so you can understand the underlying cofactors as to why a particular outcome may, may be so. Because sometimes like if you just go, you know, just collecting like the historical, just we just want basic data because something, something such as even just race or gender, if you do not take that into context and how you're how evaluating um, some underlying cofactors, you may miss some things. Right, because even with, um, I'm glad that we're finally beginning to see more um, emphasis on really having data that even addresses how intersectional intersectionality plays a role in how people's lived experiences are are mapped out, are you know codified, and even even programmed, right? Because in the uh, in this world that we live in, we're li we're we're living in a, a more technological you know era, and so even like from an engineering standpoint, one of the things that um, we're we're beginning to to hear more about is even just the the implicit bias in the coding systems, right? And how we code for 
but whether it's facial recognition or how we code, you know, for for gender related items, it's like those sensors for hands. Bro, oh God, yo, tell me, I literally I used that example in school one time. I was like, I literally there are certain places I would go, and I'm like, and I would have to turn my hand over, it and the, that's when it works. And I was like. Because um, I, would, I, would I would ask somebody else to do it, and it works for them. You know? And it seems so simple that we could just brush it off. But if it affects, like, a whole grouping of people, then that says something back, back just on a design level. Same thing for airbags in cars? Ooh. Oh, yes. Yes. How they're designed have, for men. They're not designed for women, especially if they're petite. Or, or pregnant. Exactly. So women are more likely to die even with the airbag than they are for men. All right. So then we move on to uh, what is a halo effect? Yes. Halo effect is a positive effect a person or a place has on you that can cause a bias. Uh, you know, say, for example, um, again, this is in context to recruiting. So you're interviewing a candidate. Now, the candidate went to the same college as you did. Or the candidate uh, likes the same sport as you like. Oh, yes. Now, yes. everything else gets covered under that halo. Oh, he's from my college. Of course. <laughs> right? That would be perfect. Right. Perfect. And we may not, it may not be conscious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's playing a role. The opposite of that is known as the horn effect bias. Mm. The horn effect is when one negative impression influences your overall opinion of the person. Um. Oh, and that one negative impression may have nothing to do with the job qualification mm -hmm. or the ability of the person. The person mm. otherwise meet all the requirements to have the job. Mm. But because something irked you about that person, you don't like it. It's the opposite of halo effect. Mm. So there's something you like about the person and everything else gets covered up with that halo and looks mm -hmm. positive. Yeah. And the opposite of that is the horn effect. There's one thing about this person you don't like. I don't know. It could be the way the person nods their head when they talk. Oh, oh yeah, that's true. It could be something as simple as that. The person could have a tick. They're not even, they are not aware of it. Yes. But it's irking you. Mm, yeah. The person has allergies. I know of a person that if uh, somebody is sniffing, like their nose is running, yeah. they're doing that. It drives them nuts. Yeah. Oh. This, this is another teacher I know. If there's one kid in the class who's sniffing, the oh. teacher says, my head will explode if this kid sniffs. Oh, my God. Oh. <laughs> and that's to... how strong an effect these biases have on us. If we don't consciously control ourselves and manage them, yeah. the teacher can lose his mind <laughs> over that little kid. And it's not oh. the kid's fault. The poor kid's got allergies. But like, you can't control that. Exactly. Exactly. And so, and that's the horn effect bias. Because there's something about the person that's having a negative effect on you that mm. can affect your behavior towards that person. Oh, oh, right. So, oh, yeah. The, if the, yeah. The, so the, it affects you. And then you, in turn, behave differently towards that person. And here's the key. Here's the key. We cannot control how we feel, mm. but we can control how we act. Mm. Yes. And we need to learn to distinguish that because a lot of people start feeling guilty for how they feel. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ooh, that's a word right there. Feel guilty for how you feel. Never try to change the way you feel because mm. feeling is natural. Yeah. It's okay to feel annoyed yeah. with the sniffing sound. It's how you feel. You can't change how you feel. All yeah. you can do is, okay, I know this makes me annoyed and irritated. I must be mindful to not act on it. That part. So learn to distinguish how you feel and how you act as a consequence of that feeling. And do mm. separate them and manage them. You can feel angry or upset or annoyed or whatever, you may not like someone's choice of clothes or hair, oh, that, or whatever it is. Okay. But oh. make sure you make that distinction in your mind just because I don't like it doesn't mean it's bad. It doesn't mean that this person does not deserve an opportunity. 
you, hold on. You mentioned something. You mentioned something that I would like to stop on for for a second. Appearance, appearance, and how that sometimes does affect if somebody gets hired or not. So whether that is you have piercings or you have a tattoo or, or body modification or hair. Because I remember, even like it's weird, but like I yo, because it took me to when I was graduating college, and. I remember even the year before that, I knew a guy who had locks all throughout college. And it was, oh my God, he had a big, beautiful like crown of locks. And one day he comes to school and it was all chopped up. And he looked like a he looked like a little boy again. It's weird, it's weird to say. And I was like, oh my gosh, you decided to cut your locks. And he was like, no, I have an interview tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And I really felt for him. And 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 but even then, like at that point, like I didn't even know. I didn't know how to have the conversation, but I was just like, well, that's unfair. I'm like, nobody else has to cut their hair to go get a job. Like, it was, I just found out, it, like, I, I remember it was very unsettling to me. But again, but I couldn't have the conversation. They started serving memos that you can't have certain kind of hair at your, at your workplace. Uh, what, 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 what happened? I think there were places that were sending out memos uh, that you can't have certain kind of hair, like dreadlocks and stuff. You can't. Oh, have I mean, place of work. I had a summer job that that was in the pamphlet where you know, like, if, if, I think because I was like, I'm gonna braid my hair just so you know, because it was a. I was like, because it was like, it, it, it actually had braids and locks together in that, and I was like, I need to braid my hair. I need to plait my hair just because it, it was a water park, and I'm like. What are those things to my hair? And they like you want if you want me to look a certain way, I'm gonna need to do something to it. And so they're like, okay, we'll make an exception. But I'm like, but I didn't want it to be an exception for me because I recognize that other people would have to do things. And so okay, so quickly back to the college in- incident. So that when he did that, like I, it, it bothered me. However, I found myself doing the same thing when I was graduating, where I was like, I even had that talk with one of our person, like like it's our staff persons in the College of Engineering. And you know, I was I was I was explaining how I was like, hey listen, like I don't know, like that would it would it seem fake if you know I I, I well, well I'm trying to remember. Oh yeah, because I had my hair but like pulled up like in a nice neat bun, whatever. And I remember like intentionally, like, cause I had my hair braided. I was like, I knew I could not go and do interviews with a hair with hair braided. So I made sure like my hair was out and cleared and whatever, and very simple, clean, sleek thing. And it was until I get, until I got the job and that was like in for like a hot minute, then is when, you know, I felt comfortable. I had to like, I had to read the scene and check the vibes out before I'm like, okay, I can go back to my usual hair braids and stuff like that. But for me, it was like, it was like this thing, like we all understood, like, like that's how, that's how the system works. Like if you, if you go with braids, you look at it a certain way. If you go, like if, if instead I just have my hair out, like in an Afro, even that is perceived in a certain way. If it had Bantu knots or if it had colorful hair, that's all perceived a certain way. So, I mean, like, I know it took me, and I'll be honest, it took me a long time to get comfortable just, you know, doing my hair however I needed to, 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 you know, protect it and keep it healthy. But also recognize that, like, every time I changed it, there was gonna be a conversation. Like, oh my God, is that you? Who is that? What? What? I can't even notice you. Or like, people legit, like, don't even, like, know it's me. But I'm like, dude, I just passed you like yesterday. It was like, it's a totally different person. And like, they, I, they, they I, have I, don't, I don't do a lot of stuff with my hair. Um, but I can't, I can't count on my fingers how many times I've experienced, both with professional people and in oh, yeah. circles, where people will touch my hair and say, oh, your hair are actually soft and normal. What the heck is that supposed to mean? Normal, yes, right? Yeah, my hair are normal, but people presume that your hair are frizzy, they're going to feel a certain way, Mm -hmm. and they are surprised when they don't see that. That's called expectation bias. Oh, oh, come on, tell us about that. 
<laughs> expectation bias is slightly different from confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is based on your beliefs and assumptions. Mm -hmm. Expectation bias is based on what you expect from the person. Mm. So if you have certain expectations or, or and if someone meets those expectations, whether they're good or bad, mm. then you base your decisions on what you expected. And then you will disregard anything that contra in, in, uh, that contradicts your expectations. Mm. Go side to side with your confirmation bias. It's called expectation bias. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, because I mean, wow. and I think they're all like little layers of the onion. They're yes. all to each other, and you gotta separate them and identify each one of them separately to know which one to peel off one at a time because they all can come together and make a big stinking onion. Oh, come <laughs> on, say it! Like, you should look at that. Just like, it that was so simple to understand. Like, it doesn't seem as complex as otherwise one would think it to be. Yeah, and then you ask yourself the question, things like, are my expectations realistic? Again, Manage that's expectations. Self -check. That self-check, that self-awareness, because bias kicks in when, mm -hmm. you, when you have to make a quick decision and mm -hmm. you have a lot of information to process. Same thing about implicit bias. You yes. have a quick decision to make. And that's the, that's the challenge with the police work. Yes. When they Ooh. go in hot, when they go into a tense situation, okay. they don't have time to look at the layers of the onions and self check and go splunking in the caverns of the cave. Mr. They've got seconds. They've got seconds. They need to make decisions. Yeah. yeah. So they have to be trained, and this has to happen so often that mm. they can work through all the layers really, really fast. Have you seen those chefs chop the onions? Yes, I love those. They have to. The police have. To trained to chop onions like the chef, go through all the reels real fast in milliseconds, mm -hmm. manage your implicit bias real quick, check, 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 check for facts, check, 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 check for bias. Mm. Thing. And then make an action that you're supposed to take that is the correct action that is not based on bias. It mm. takes training, a lot of training, a lot of training. Mm. And obviously they, Based on current outcomes, it seems like there is a lot of opportunity for growth in that particular area. And hopefully we will see more of that happening, um, as a, hopefully as a result of this movement of calling for, for change, for a better future, not only in, in policing, but in education, in medicine, and in, in all our respective areas of profession. Um, That's so where our money needs to be spent. Instead of arming the police, we need to train the police. We need the police. I, I, know, I know there are organizations that want to totally abolish them. Well, if you well we need them, order. How are you going to call? I mean, oh, okay, that, right? So, oh, that's a whole other conversation, which maybe we will have, we should have. Um, yeah, I'm like, right? Because at the end of the day, people want, what people want is to feel safe. Wake up people want to be safe. Stranger in your house. Who right? You call? I mean, you, you, you do need to call somebody, but does it have to be an armed person? Does it have to be the police? It could be somebody else. Because I'm like, there, there are communities that do have a different system of order and security that doesn't necessarily have to rely on police or the policing system as is defined currently. So. The armed police is unique. So mm -hmm. many countries around the world, the police is not armed. In Canada, the police is not yeah. armed. In India, I think only after a certain cadre do the police get armed. Uh, in yeah. UK, the police is not armed. Yeah. Not the police system. Mm -hmm. They don't have to be armed. Oh, yeah. I was like, you have to change the system to change the outcomes. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that, yeah. Because at, at the end of the day, I am all for, again, we still, we still need to have safe communities, right? Like we said, at the end of the day, people still have to, and that's a natural need. Like we want to feel safe. We want to be safe. We want to save communities, but just based on the current system, I'm not sure that that is what's working. And, and, and you're right. Like that is a conversation that absolutely needs to be had over and over again until we are able to cre actually create a system that, you know, addresses people really as full human beings. Um, right. Yeah. I yeah. do want to be mindful of time, but oh, as I said, yeah. we have 32 different kind of biases, and I think we barely touched upon a handful, of them, but that's okay. And I but wanted to ask you, do we have a conversation at some time where we're going to talk about race? Yes, uh, we will, and we should. Yes, we will. Because I think initially you did mention a lot of us are not a race. We're all bi, tri, quadri, penta, hexa, septa, racial, if you start going back to your ancestry. 
right right exactly no generations not not many of us can identify to be of one race okay facts facts all right thanks for colonialism colonization the The colonizer always comes back in the the british took indians and took them to africa took them to the middle east took them to ghana took them everywhere the indians were taken everywhere the african people were taken everywhere and they um uh, mixed with each other so we have not had quote unquote race pure races for a long well, time yeah and i mean i guess it goes back to the definition of like how do we define race right well what I'm like are we different races or cuz i'm like people are like well we're all human race like, well if that's what the definition of race is then like are we like, and and not, it goes back to understanding like well really understanding the, the difference between how do we define and see race or ethnicity or nationality right uh and 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 all these again to me i'm like all these are things that we do need to normalize the conversation we need to destigmatize the conversation to normalize it so we can all you know really have that apples to apples conversation making sure we're we're speaking the same language the same context you know and just literally really just like being good human beings to one another being considered human beings to one another and that's what i hope for all of us myself included yeah that's that's what i want for all of us so yeah yeah being mindful of time do you have any last uh comments before we sign off today We had a very poor turnout for this elections on the 18th. 28% of people voted. 28%. That's not good. But with that said, Harrisburg did a great job. Yo, listen. Lady is on fire. <laughs> Yo, fam, like, oh, like, but but listen, I agree with you also. So, on the positive side, we hope that, you know, if if you happen to be voting, if if your if your region is voting in the generals in November, please get out and vote. However and you vote, please get out and vote. And yeah. get in, you're right. Because yeah, cuz yeah, we we've talked about informed consent cuz that's what we give when we vote, we're giving consent for these folks to represent us and make decisions on for our best on our behalf. So, you know, we want to make sure that like if you're going out there when you're going out there, to get your voice heard to to provide your consent may it be from a place of you know informed consent right as you vote for whoever you choose to vote for um in your respective areas please get out and vote right <laughs> please, a lot you. of people knew of the top 2 3 4 candidates and they didn't realize there are lots of other, other candidates on <gasps> the other side of the ballot Yes, right. I've got sample ballots available on my page. I share the site where you can go see your sample ballot even if you're going to go to the polls. Yes. Oh, and then the- what your ballot's going to look like before you go to the polls, do your research, get to know your candidates, especially if your candidates are cross-filing. Yes. Make yeah. sure you vote for them, especially if you just want to do quote unquote a straight ticket. Mm-hmm. Make sure you are aware of which candidates have cross-filed which have not. Mm-hmm. So really need the people to start using their voice in their vote. Absolutely. And and literally be informed and one of the things we're doing here in in Harrisburg is there's actually a lot of platforms really doing a lot of groundwork um educating folks because that's the thing we recognize perhaps that is one of the reasons people do not turn out is cuz they feel inadequate. They don't feel like pardon they don't feel like they have enough information to make a decision on any per- on any one person right and so we want to make sure that you are empowered when you're going to the vote or when you're going to send in your mail mail in ballot which actually I'm, i'm i'm a huge proponent for the mail in ballot option cuz you get that. to sit cuz you get to sit with them you get to see and you, you can google that's why we got google the googler okay like google some people find out like find out what this position is about like you said you're you, here locally you're running for the proprietary huh we got mdjs our magisterial district judges our our law of court of common common pleas we got like there's so many positions going on right the city c- controller um what was that there's like literally like a whole bunch Super of like positions. members supervisors city count yeah right like man there are so many positions out here that we as residents as constituents we vote these folks in and we vote them out so just get familiar with the folks that who are actually currently in power step one get familiar with the people who are currently in power and want to stay in power ask yourself why and ask yourself also how have they been doing the work 
have they actually been representing us? And if not, perhaps consider voting somebody else in who, you know, who wants to represent the needs of the people. So how, again, I keep saying, however you wanna vote, please, please vote, please get your voices heard because your vote truly is your voice out here, especially in this season, family, get your voices heard. Let's get our voices heard. And I, and I thank you so much, Dr. Singh. I appreciate your time for and being consistent about it and for you, you forever be coming through with it. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. And I, you know what? I always wish you well. I wish you nothing but the best through this, through, through this journey. I, I'm and, planning to do a workshop as a fundraiser where we'll go through these implicit by all, all the different kinds of biases and talk about real life examples of them. So yes. when I have my ducks in a row, I'll share that with you and yes. see how many people attend. It'll yes. be educational and informative. It won't be politically based. Okay. It'll be totally educational and informative. But I'm here I, for <laughs> as an educator, that's what I want to do is educate the people. It doesn't matter what party, doesn't matter what affiliation. Information is power. Information Ooh. is power. Is it though? It's right. I think I don't know, right? In, like information is information, but it's only powerful how you use it, how you apply it. It, it is power. Now, whether you use positive power, or negative power. Ooh. Oh, oh, come on, see, come on, teacher, teacher. It's like nuclear power, nuclear power. Yeah. Use it for electricity. Oh yeah. Right, it's bombs. Yeah, I went. I went. I went back to like the kinet, the potential versus kinetic energy. Right, it's like it's yeah. Information at its uh, you're right. Information at its by itself is just the, the potential energy, and once you once you you know add motion to it, add momentum to it, that's when we get the kinetic energy. That's how we get to mobilize people for true effective change. And I'm here for it. Listen, yeah, listen, y'all got gems today, y'all. <laughs> Oh yeah, so please look out for that workshop that's coming through. Um, I'll provide more details as Dr. Andre Singh provides that to us. Fam, thank you again, thank you so much. And for all of you guys out there watching, please come back for the next Let's Talk About It. Uh, we have a lot of interesting topics lined up literally all the way through July into August currently. So uh, come on back, come on back, tell a friend, invite a friend, and uh, we'll catch you on the next Lunch and Learn. We'll see y'all. Have a good night. <laughs> Bye, guys. See ya.